she had been writing a song about her mom. And so she sent me those lyrics and I was able to tinker and put a little screw in here and put a syllable there. And it just fit really nicely with my melody and added to it quite a bit too. So it was a true collaboration on the lyrics. Brian Smith here, and welcome to the Dream Path Podcast, where I try to get inside the heads of talented creatives from all over the world. My goal is to demystify and humanize the creative process and make it accessible to everyone. Now let's jump in. Sue Innes is on the show. Sue is an internationally recognized songwriter, best known for co-writing more than 70 songs with Anne and Nancy Wilson of the platinum-selling rock band Heart, Sue has more than 35 million records sold, including 10 gold, 4 platinum, 1 triple platinum, and 1 quintuple platinum album. Sue is also a member of the band The Lovemongers with Anne and Nancy Wilson, and recently co-wrote and performed on Nancy's first solo album, You and Me, which was released last Friday. When she's not writing or recording, Sue teaches songwriting workshops, and her craft of songwriting class sells out every quarter at Shoreline Community College. She also helped develop a songwriting interactive experience for the Experience Music Project with Paul Allen and is on the faculty at the Pacific Northwest Film Scoring Program, where she teaches songwriting for film. This is one of the more wide-ranging interviews I've done on the podcast, not only because she has such an amazing career, but also because I have a personal connection to Sue through my dad, who was Hart's tour pilot for many years. In this interview, Sue and I talk about how she met Anne and Nancy as a teenager and how that friendship blossomed into a decades-long songwriting collaboration. We also talk about her adventures flying with my dad in Europe, and discuss the origin story of the Lovemongers. And if you stick around until the end of the interview, you'll hear Sue give me some songwriting tips after I play her part of a song I wrote in high school more than 40 years ago, but never finished. So without further ado, let's jump into my chat with the incredibly talented and multifaceted artist, Sue Ennis. Well, Sue, welcome to Dream Path Podcast. Thank you. Thank you. So fun to finally meet you and be with you after lots of missed places and lots of lots of schedule juggling. Here we are. Yes. Thank you for making time. I know you're so busy with your teaching schedule. Yeah, it's been a, a couple of months since we first tried to connect. <laughs> really? And um, how's your sister doing, by the way? Thanks for asking, Brian. Yeah, she's in she's in really good shape. Yeah, had a little bit of a of a scare there, but uh, but everything went well, and uh, she's on the mend. So thank you. Yeah. Well, I first want to say uh, congratulations on this uh, solo album that you collaborated with Nancy on, uh, called "You and Me," Nancy Wilson's first solo album. Yes. Since starting her music career in the the late sixties, early seventies. So, yes, yeah, I, I listened to what I could. It's I don't think it's fully released yet um, that I could see. No, I think it's Friday on the on May. Or, yeah, I think it. Well, May eighth, whenever that is, the fifth. So anyway, it's coming right. No, actually, they, I think they do release mu- new music Friday. That's the thing now. So uh, it should soon be available. Nice. Yeah, why well, I, I listened to what I could. You and me is the song that I really connected with for obvious reasons uh you are featured on that track What a touching song. Oh, thank you. You know, um, I can tell you a little bit about how that song came to be. Um, And, you know, I had, I mean, I had no idea that, uh, you know, Nance would want it to be um, the title song for the record. But um, I think, um, yeah, I I had, had written a song a while back, you know, a year and a half or so. 
um, that was just a personal song for me that uh, a little bit of a, of a disguised song about my mom and uh, and about her death, uh, but uh, in a kind of a, 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 it had a lot of imagery and it was called Follow Me and it was Follow Me uh, and I was going to keep her safe and I don't need to go into the first iteration, but I played it. Uh, for Nance and she really loved the music and she said that she thought that the words really weren't for her but that it's it was crazy that she actually had she had been writing a song about her mom she had been mm -hmm. really missing her mom and um and so she sent me those lyrics and uh and I was able to tinker and you know, put a little screw in here and put a syllable there, and and they and it just fit really nicely with my melody, mm -hmm. and um, and uh, you know, add, added to it uh, quite a bit too. So it was a true collaboration on the lyrics, and we both were of one. I was going to say mind, but really one heart. Uh, you know, wanting to um, conjure up a scenario where we could we could meet our moms again. And I don't mean in a, any kind of, you know, weird woo woo way, but rather that impulse that sometimes we have, you know, uh, it, when our moms are, are gone, mm -hmm. uh, you know, when you're, when you're in a hard place or a lonely place or whatever it may be. And you think if I could just call my mom right now, th those ah. of us who were lucky enough to have right. wonderful relationships, you know? So in any case, that's, uh, that was something that uh, we both had experienced that if only I could just talk to her and, uh, and we put sort of a, you know, a, a nicer spin on it. And, mm -hmm. and it was so cool, um, to have Nance sing it. I mean, I was just, I was so thrilled that the, the song, you know, turned into something that, uh, she fully embraced and sang with so much sincerity, you know, it's really nice to hear her voice. She, I know she had, um, some, you know, she sang on, uh, uh, was it these dreams or dreams, yeah. yeah, these dreams back in the mid eighties and, and had that turn into a number one hit and, and demonstrated that she has the chops for sure. Um, uh, but just hasn't been featured as a vocalist. So it was really cool to hear this. <laughs> That's what happens when you share a band with Ann Wilson. <laughs> Yeah, oh yeah <laughs> not to be it's silly true. but you know i mean she she certainly yeah i right. mean you know uh you know one of one of i think rock's greatest voices and i will say that as as her friend and yeah um and a fan and you know and uh and then nance uh, always had a few moments a few sort of spotlights in the live show where she could sing whatever she wanted you know and she often opted to sing um Covers. I think she she uh, sang uh, um, Mona Lisa's and Mad Hatter's and an old Elton John tune that just really beautiful melody. And then uh, on the last tour, the Boxer, and um, you know, so something a little more acoustic focused. And yeah, um, with Sammy Hagar, right? Yeah, that's, that's an right. interesting um, you know collaboration there. I, I was not expecting to see his name on there. You know, he's an old friend of a very long time friend of Jeff, Jeff Bywater, Nance's husband. And so Nance has, of course, gotten to know him and um, they have a really fun, playful relationship, you know, in Instagram. And they, you know, they josh around. It's it's great. And I think she originally had an, um, a song that was a big, big rocker that was a contender for the record. Um, and she sent it to Sammy and it. And he said, you know, this is kind of the obvious move. You know, this is exactly what everyone would expect me to sing on this kind of hard rocking thing. What else do you have? And, you know, she said, well, the boxer. And he said, oh, I love that song. And so mm. that's how it came to be. They wanted to make a little bit of a of a surprise that you wouldn't imagine, you know. I'm looking forward to hearing it on Friday. I wasn't able to find it online because it's not, not released out there yet. yet. Yeah, it's. Uh, I, I was able just to listen to maybe two or three songs, just little teasers. Yeah. Um, but the uh, I listened to that Mark Marin interview with Nancy, by the way, that you posted on Twitter. I listened to that last night and uh, learned a lot about Nancy, and also heard a little bit about how this solo album came to be. And it sounds like the pandemic really contributed to you know the isolation of the pandemic and the downtime of the pandemic allowed for Nancy to uh, create this thing without the distraction of being on the road and and all of those other pressures. Is is that your understanding? 
Oh, for sure. Um, you know, I'd say, you know, Nance, Nance is my, you know, my true, truly my best friend. And, you know, it's been an amazing thing to have, you know, she was 12 when I met her and, you know, we just, we're just two like minded souls. And so, you know, I, I, I know where she is uh, emotionally and spiritually, you know, usually uh, as we move through, move through life. And, you know, she really was at a place, I think, uh, you know, kind of exhausted and turned inside out from all the touring and travel mm -hmm. um, and then was stuck at home and thought, you know, what am I going to do? I'm not just going to sit here. And she started to um, she started to, you know, just put it out there, do a couple of covers and enjoyed the experience. It was like it's really fulfilling and brought some purpose into, you know, being being quarantined. So um so I think that was that was actually a big part of it. In some ways, you know, I'm not sure she would have had the same kind of focus, uh, you know, if if she weren't housebound. Yeah. So, yeah. So I'd I'd like to go back in time with you to, and I know you've told this story before because I've heard other interviews with you, but I'd like to hear it directly from you um, in this interview. How you met Anne and Nancy and how that relationship flourished into what it became in the the seventies and eighties and um, beyond. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's my go-to story because it's what really happened. And uh, it was uh, the scene of the meeting was uh, it was in a high school class in high school, German class, actually. Um, I was a pretty new girl from uh, having moved uh, to Seattle from Denver or actually Bellevue was, suburb of Seattle. And, um, as you know, mm -hmm. and, uh, and so I really didn't have too many friends, but I did, um, I, I did have the Beatles and that was sort of the thing that I was such a Beatle fanatic and they, and they, they really buoyed me it during a time when I was kind of, you know, disoriented. And so, um, they had played in town and, uh, and, I'd gone to the show and, you know, was way in the back and just saw these little tiny guys on stage and really just, I mean, I thought there they are, but everyone's screaming. So in any case, I didn't have, you know, a super amazing experience there. I was glad I was there, but in any case, it, the Beatles were fresh in the air and my dad uh, th one morning I was reading the paper and he said, Oh, look, here's a girl from your school, Sammamish, uh, who won the Beatle essay. Uh, so there was some kind of contest which is what the Beatles mean to me. And uh, so she'd written her, her paragraph and, uh, and it won. And so there she was, and she had a, uh, one of those little super eight cameras that was her, her prize. So she posed for the photo and there was this girl, Anne, who sits in front of me in the German class. Right. You know, so I, um, and I, 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 we were not friends at all. I mean, there was nothing. I just knew of her, but I thought, there's a commonality. There's someone who knows the Beatles. Okay, mm -hmm. this mm -hmm. is someone in my tribe. So I, so that day, I, um, I think the Beatles had a new record out, uh, uh, called a Revolver, and so I thought, well, I'll see if she's a real Beatle fan because you know, we'll see. So I sat behind her, and I before class started, I started humming the most obscure song on that record, just to sort of throw her a line and see if she'd take the bait. And if she could recognize it, and uh, it was called uh, "Love You Too" by George Harrison, and mm. I just kind of went, doom, da -doom, da -doom, da -doom, da -doom. and she, uh, man, she just took it and ran. She was just like, "I've got a fish." <laughs> I mean, I, I was, I was so excited, but I didn't know how to say, "Hey, um, you know, my name is Sue," and you know, I just thought, "I'll just see if the Beatle thing is a connection," and it really was. She whipped around in her chair, and we just started talking. And she said, "Do you have the record?" And yes. And what's the best song on there? And did you go to the Beatles show? Yes. And all of a sudden, it just was. I found my person. So, um, so then, uh, you know, I was. I was just really in, you know, really happy to find someone that I could share this music with. And she, um, and, she, and I remember I, you know, I was a teenage girl. And so it's like, well, I'll call you and we can talk sometime. So I, I called her and uh, talk on the phone and, and in the background, 
there was this commotion going on. And I, I, I have to say, I kind of got irritated because I really wanted to get to know her and have her attention. But in the background, there was all this laughing and this, it sounded like a kid tumbling on these beds, trying to distract her. And that was Nancy. And Anne was completely was laughing the whole time. And, and they were, they just were, they were just having a, a, a blast. So I thought, well, you know, this is weird because I have a younger sister and I, 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 we have no, not, there's no real commonality there. So uh, I eventually, uh, you know, met Nance and really hit it off with this kid. I mean, she was such an amazing, and, and she already played guitar. I mean, she was this 12 year old, hilarious. I mean, I just had never met anybody like her. So uh, that was the beginning of um, a friendship. They they already had a, a number of, as you know from the interview um, with Mark, they you know they had a, a number of groups already going, uh, and um, immediately asked me to join when they saw that I had a guitar, and I could not imagine doing that. I was way too uh, introverted, and uh, you know I just was not, did not could not go to the performer place at all in the be- in the beginning, and uh, so. Um, so they, you know, started, we just started playing in the, in the bedroom and they showed me car, um, lots and lots of chords and they, ta- uh, I knew how to harmonize a little bit, but they got me deeper into it. Um, one of the things that was so cool about both of those young ladies was that they had had a lot of experience in choirs and uh, high school choirs, junior high, as they called it then, choirs, and they had really good ears. And they also had sung a lot in their family, and um, and so they they had a natural harmony. Besides the fact that they were sisters as well, so um, it was really really fun to, to um, have them f- help me find my place in a three part harmony. They certainly guided me there, and that was just a, you know a revelation to me. So so that's where it all started with kind of a fan approach to music, and then the fact that they were already, you know, really working on something and kind of brought me in uh, as far as I could go, but I could right. not go to the stage. Now, you know? were you self-taught at this point and were they self-taught? Yes, absolutely. Um, I think that, you know, they had, they had their, their mom had bought them, uh, what was it called? Oh, Mel Bay. I think that was an, a 60s uh, guitar book with all the chords in it. I had a chord book as well, Mm -hmm. but I I mean, I really have to say I was a very amateur guitar player. And once they showed me, uh, you know, how the E went with the A and I, I, I mean, it was, it was just, they really opened a musical door for me. Mm -hmm. Um, I already had, um, I played piano. I had had a a number of piano lessons along the way. And, um, and I remember uh, when I was moving away, when I was uh, in eighth grade from um, from my my, my ho- home, and actually in San Diego, um, uh, I remember the teacher said, um, "She said you should continue p- playing." I, I mean, just that's uh, you have something, and I never forgot that. And you know, it could have it, it was just it, it made me feel like I might have someone recognize something in me, which mm. I had. So that was a little bit of something that gave me some confidence to, uh, you know, to sing, sing the the songs with them. So that's awesome. You know, I I find that collaboration and just playing and singing with other people is, is a portal into somewhere that you just cannot go on your own through these self-teach books. Um, I started with, I think, Alfred's self-teach Oh, yeah. um, book one for guitar. And, um, in fact, I did that, this, co- I'll show you the guitar behind me. Cause it's the one some that, nice looking guitars there, Brian. Well, this one here, wow. this <gasps> one was given to my dad by, yep. I believe Howard Lease. No kidding. Yeah. And so yeah. what's the make on that? This is a limited, odi- uh, a limited edition ovation, ovation cl- yeah. classical guitar it's i thought electric. it was classical look at that yeah look at that wide neck it's got the the nylon strings beautiful and so my um my dad had that laying around and because he was obviously you know the tour pilot for heart and mm-hmm. had um a love for music at a young age and he played and i looked up to him so i picked up that guitar and 
And, and I learned uh, from that book, Alfred Self Teach, uh, book number one. And that's as far as I got. It's just that book. <laughs> but the rest of my musical knowledge came from playing with other people and bands and, and just fireside, you know, uh, acoustic sessions and that type of thing. And I tell you, it is, um, it's like a university course when you work with the right people. And, Isn't uh, it? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that, I think that's that's the truth with uh, other collabor- uh, songwriting collaborations that I've that I've uh, been in. I, I I did some write. I did a bunch of songs with a guy who's a film composer and who was Ber- Berkeley School of Music, mm. and it was the first time that I'd ever sat down in the same room with someone who, <clears throat> excuse me, who actually got out uh, staff paper and wrote the notes that we were writing. And usually, you just put on the old cassette and recorded it and that that made me think i i'm kind of out of my depth here but i feel it's good for me you know it's just above where you are and and it makes you makes you rise up so my understanding is you went off to college after Mm -hmm. uh, high school and and ann and nancy um i think had a couple of albums under their belt and were touring how did you reconnect with them and and what was the um you know, what was the impetus behind that reconnection and that collaboration that started at, uh, I think, Dog and Butterfly? That's right. Um, so, yeah, I had uh, I was actually in Berkeley, California, uh, at, at uh, Cal there, uh, uh, getting my master's in German literature, of all things. Uh, I, I just loved lit and I was I was pretty good in German. So that was my focus. Uh for a while, but um, I should say that I had kept in very close touch with Anne and Nance as things started to take off uh, for them with um, Dreamboat Annie and then Little Queen. Um, you know, pardon me, it wasn't at, it wasn't as though you know we split off and then reun- came back many years later. It was we saw each other at Christmas. Um, I remember uh, in my apartment. <laughs> in Berkeley, they'd be on the phone and you know, they'd, they'd be on the road and they'd call me at three in the morning and I'd be, I'd get really irritated with them. Like, don't, you know, <laughs> don't you see that not the whole world is a rock star? And, and it, right. I mean, it was all in fun, but in any case, um, you know, we, we certainly had, had kept in touch and um, they would always play me early versions of the songs, but I was on a, on a different path. And, um, and so they were coming to play in San Francisco uh, Hart was playing at a place called the Cow Palace, uh, which was a venue back then. Uh, that was, uh, you know, the equivalent to the uh, arena in Seattle. Oh wow! And um, and I remember that uh, you know they they came over to Berkeley in a limo, and I hadn't seen them for a while. They were just coming off nine months on the road straight, um, and uh, two women and thirty men. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll never forget that. Uh, and they, um, but I mean, they just, you know, I, I just can't tell you how much they earned where they got to, you mm-hmm. know, the, these, the, the, the small little places, the nine months on the road, you know, bless the guys, but still, <laughs> you know, day in, day out, uh, amazing, amazing fortitude and, and dedication to, to to what they wanted to get to. And so they came to my little place and they got out. I remember they, they were all dolled up. They had these, they just had perms, you know, it was the, it was some new look mm-hmm. and they had these beautiful jackets. And, and you know, I, I saw them through new eyes in a way because they were, they were very glamorous and, uh, and they looked b- beautiful. I mean, I, I, I mean, of course, I, I always knew they were beautiful women, but, but this was stunning. They had boots on, and they looked like rock stars. And when I saw them, I, you know, they probably saw the surprise in my face. I'll never forget. And they just said, they started laughing. They go, I know. Look, I know. We <laughs> this is this is what we kind of have to do. Right. But I mean, that, not that they minded it, but it was it was really fun. That you know to to. You know they were still in there. Uh, they hadn't completely, you know, become uh, uh, sassy rock stars. And uh, so we went and started playing guitars that afternoon. They had about, uh, I guess, four or five hours with me before they had to go play their show. And um, the limo guy waited outside, and we just had the best reunion you can imagine. You know, I was deep into German literature, and all of a sudden, this sort of uh incredible golden thing washed over me the 
the, be- the beauty of making music, as you said, with, with other people. It's just indescribable. And, um, and I think that what they got from it, if I may be so bold, is just, you know, a connection with somebody who really knows them and isn't treating them like rock stars. Also, maybe because I have a, a woman mm-hmm. uh, and we, you know, we laughed so hard. It was just a, an amazing reunion. And at one point they they brought out some, uh, you know, like notebook paper and they said, uh, Epic Records wants us to deliver a not a, a complete album so i think at that time it was nine or ten songs um in two months and we haven't started writing and we have no ideas because all we've done is go on stage and see hotel rooms but we have this little idea and so um they showed it to me and it was uh it was actually pretty well along i mean i could tell they had a verse and a chorus and i helped them uh with the bridge and then i had a some it, it, and it was just all for fun we were laughing the whole time and then we'd sing it and we go that's fun that's pre- pleasant in any case uh i just didn't think it was that i just thought it was fun and uh suddenly there was a song dog and butterfly and um and uh, you know i helped with some lyrics uh, here and there and they went back to Seattle and played it for Mike Flicker, their producer, um, right away because he was saying we've got we've got to get songs and we got to go with this. They had uh, they already had studio time booked, um, and uh, he said, "Why don't you go back there next weekend and see what else you can come up with?" And so uh, it started a very surreal, as I look back on it, a time of writing this, this record where. You know, they had a big advance at that point from their label. And so mm-hmm. they, they would fly down. And they, we would go to uh, this penthouse suite at the top of the – at Knob Hill and, you know, fancy San Francisco for the weekend. The limo would come pick me up from my little hovel. You know, I was like Cinderella. I would go go <laughs> to this incredible, <laughs> incredible place uh, at the Mark Hopkins uh, at all, all these, you know, different beautiful hotels. And we'd stay in all weekend and write a song. And on Sunday, the limo dropped me off, you know, and I was went back to reality and off they went uh, to Seattle. And they'd call me during the week and say, the song is really coming together. We made this change or they just love it. But I mean, it seemed like we were on a roll, you know, and it, it all came from um, it all came from the spirit of kind of fun and love of music uh, in that in those days without any sense of what uh, a label was looking for, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I'm looking at the track list for dog and butterfly and, and what an album uh, you, you've got. I mean, who, who was in the room during these sessions? I assume just everyone was there collaborating and contributing in some way. Um, it was, was it mainly you Anne, and Nancy and then, you know, Roger and, and Howard would, would sit in um, on a few songs or was everybody there for every song? No, um, I would say that, uh, you know, f- so uh, let me just uh, choose a song. So Mistral Wind, for example, mm-hmm. uh, Raj had a riff uh, for that, yeah. uh, that uh, Nance had recorded. Da, 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 da. I think Nance spoke about that in the interview. Um, and she brought it to Anne and me and just said, can we build something around this? You know, this was the the foundation. But Raj was never there. We we find we we went to the band with a completed song that had been built around that one, uh, you know, signature riff. Mm. But it went in all. It went. You know, we fleshed it out, and it went in all kinds of you know different directions. But it but that was his. So it it was sort of like that. They'd sometimes uh, give. This used to really get us. They'd sometimes. Um, you know, really to their credit, their job is to, is to rock out and make up riffs and do stuff. They go and, and record maybe a sound check and give us a, a cassette tape of, uh, you know, eight minutes of jam, a jam and, um, hand it to us and say, here's a song we wrote Mm -hmm. and we'd listen to it. And it would be eight minutes of, you know, a riff here, a riff there, a false start. Uh, sometimes something kind of cool would happen. And, but, not a song and they'd go put a singing part on it and we'd go a singing part <laughs> that, that that's the lyrics and, and the melody <laughs> that's what the song is about i mean it was all sort of in fun but it was also 
through their lens, it was like, this thing really rocks and you guys go do whatever you do to right. the singing part thing. So, um, so that, uh, you know, nowadays they call it top lining, but, uh, but that's, you know, that's uh, how we wrote most of them was uh, just three of us. Mm -hmm. Um with so then there's songwriting credits there, right? I mean, with sorry to interrupt you, Sue, but no, no. Um, you know, the what I'm still unclear on, and I'm trying to figure out over time mm -hmm. as I interview more musicians and songwriters, is the the legalities of it. So when you're writing a song, um, I guess it's an understanding that's reached as to how the songwriting credits and royalties are going to be split, and then there's a separate um, performance credit or royalty that that is assigned to that song or how, how does that work legally? Okay. Well, that's uh, pretty simple. Uh, so, it, so we have a song <laughs> and mm -hmm. it is a composition. We call it a comp, we call it a, it's called composition legally, uh, meaning, you know, lyrics, chords, melody. Okay. That's, that's the song. So uh, let's say in the case of, um, of dog and butterfly, uh, there are three writers on that that the three of us wrote that song. And so we, uh, uh, we own the composition and uh, we split up what we considered, what percentage of the, we contributed, you know, so mm -hmm. that, so the hundred percent of the pie would be split up. Uh, however, we determined uh, that to be in terms of each of our contributions. So that's, that's that side. There's also another side. Uh, that's one copyright that's for the composition. The other side of things is for the re sound recording or the master. Uh, and that's where the performers are, uh, are, are part of that, the actual performance uh, that has been recorded. That is also a copyright that you have on a song, and that uh, typically this, the master is owned by a label if you're signed to a label. Okay. So, um, and then the artists receive a royalty according to their contract with the label. So, when before they sign, they say yes, we'll agree to, you know, fourteen percent royalty, whatever it may be, eighteen percent. Okay. And that's how that's how the players are paid. Uh, with that participation from the sales of that recording, okay. but they have, but unless they wrote on the song, they would have no piece of the composition side. Mm. Are you following me? Yeah, so, yeah, that makes yeah. sense. Okay, I've heard artists before say, um, just kicking themselves. I wish I had not given up the masters before, and I think now I understand what they mean by that. Yes, yes, yeah. and as particularly today in the world of streaming, um, the master's side com is get, gets about three times as much as the composition side oh. uh, from the from the streaming services. So that's really where the gold is uh, for um, you know. I mean, again, the streaming. Uh, payments are are cr are crazy and in and small, but but there is the much larger percentage is is with those masters. That's that's the value hmm. in the streaming world. So before Dog and Butterfly, and uh, so Dreamboat Annie and and Little Queen, you know, my understanding is that Nan and uh, Ann, Ann and Nancy followed um, Roger and Michael Fisher up to Vancouver, and there was this. Um, you know, a lot of songwriting and recording and performing in Vancouver. Were you, were you pretty tuned in to what was happening? And did you know how special that, um, you know, that band was at the time? Because I would think that if they're up there in Vancouver, maybe they're flying under the radar in the United States and then they just come down and, and make this huge splash. But what were, what were you thinking at the time? Well, the earliest days of Heart, and this would be before um, this would be before Anne met Mike Mike Fisher. Um, were they were play, They were club. They were in clubs around town, and they were starting to get a following. And so there there was an awareness. I wouldn't say they were the top band in town, but they were playing out a lot. So I had seen them a number of times, and um, you know, um, Nance wasn't. She was in high school, <laughs> but. Um, but then uh, when they when they they really got serious and they moved to Vancouver uh, because I think Mike um, because you know Anne wanted to be with Mike but also I think Mike had a sort of a masterminded a vision for what they could be and was a very hard worker and uh, wanted 
you know, wanted them to work really hard. And so they did. And they, they just, um, they just committed. And so uh, they started to rise up in the band, you know, and, and become a draw for the bigger clubs in uh, Vancouver. So, uh, you know, I was aware of that. And then I'd go up there occasionally and see them and, you know, be really surprised at the what how excited people were to see them. Uh, at that time, I think they were called Little Led Zeppelin because a lot of, uh, they were doing a lot of Zeppelin covers mm -hmm. um, in, uh, in the band and they were really good. Uh, you know, Raj, uh, you know, tried, was was really nailing those uh, Jimmy Page riffs, and Anne was, for a time as she was developing her voice, was you know, an an amazing uh, Robert Plant, uh, you know, sound alike mm -hmm. uh, right. in terms of how she was approaching the rock. Yeah, yeah, I saw that two thousand was it two thousand six or eight um, tribute that they did, uh, Anne and Nancy. Um, for for Led Zeppelin, and I forget what song it was. Oh, was, was that at the uh, the at the Hall of Fame at the? Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure. What's that called? It, it was like the. Um, it was a center for performing. The Kennedy arts, Centers, or, yeah, because yeah, the, the Kennedy Centers honor, yeah, yeah, yeah. That that yeah. performance, I think, on YouTube has millions and millions of views. It's just incredible to see the members of Led Zeppelin like tearing up <laughs> as they're listening to that, that song. That was amazing, wasn't it? Standing ovation. Yeah. You know what was incredible. funny about that was um when the uh when they they came to them and said, would you like to do this? And you know, the crown jewel, uh Stairway to Heaven, uh, and close the show. Mm -hmm. that, yes, yes, yes. And uh and so uh Nance said they said, well we'll have the music director call you uh, you know, about where you want to be in the band, you know, do you want to have a guitar? And she, and she said, do you know how many times I've played Stairway to Heaven in <laughs> clubs? Like thousands, literally. And yeah. uh, and so they called, uh, you know, they, he called her up and he said, um, you know, we'd, we'll just... Uh, you you can you can do what you want, but we're you know very comfortable having um, our lead guy shadow you, and so you would pretend to play, and the guy whoever he is would would be playing the real thing, mm -hmm. and um, suggested that that might be their comfort level since they didn't really know part that well, mm -hmm. and she, that's when she said. I can handle it. Thank you. Right. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And uh, I tell you, when I saw that, I was just, <gasps> I knew they could do it, but it was such a big moment. Yeah. You know? huge. And, and, and they, and they just nailed it without, you know, like the, the pros they are. I mean, I just, I saw no nerves. I just saw, you know, steel, uh, iron will and, and professionalism, confidence. And that's what, I think that's what made it special. Just, yeah, they so did it. In terms of your um, your songwriting and your collaboration with Anne and Nancy over the years, did it when they started with the big labels in the mid '80s? And I think it was the Heart self titled album where I noticed maybe your name wasn't on as many tracks, or I yeah, don't know if that's, that's, right. that's correct. But that were the correct. were the labels starting to just push their own agenda on? Anne and Nancy at that point? Yes, they sure were. Um, I mean, the thing is, Anne and Nancy went along with it. Uh, but what happened really was that there had been two underperforming records uh, by the band, uh, Private Audition and Passion Works. Mm -hmm. And um, so... Uh, you know, they had their fans and they did OK, but they didn't do what previous records had done. And of course, those metrics are what the label looks at. And so um, and so, you know, a guy came, uh, you know, they were not in their they were not in a negotiating place of, of great power. Uh, a guy came from um, Capitol, a really terrific guy named Don Grierson. And he loved Anne's voice so much and he loved the band. And he said, you know, we want to take you from Epic. I think Epic was ready to say goodbye. Um, and, uh, and, and, but, but part of it is going to be that 
we are going to want to work with you on this and we're going to find the very best songs and um and and we're going to uh suggest a producer and uh Ron Nevison was his name and so i don't know if they were ironclad in terms of here's here's your offer you have to take these things or or if it was here's we have suggestions i'm not sure how it went down but they were um they did. They did do that and and uh, and go with it. And Don Grierson was an incredible A and R person for them, um, on the phone with them all the time, making sure that this was going to be the right record and the record that Capital wanted mm -hmm. as well. And so part of that was uh, was uh, going outside for the songs that they thought would be radio hits, mm -hmm. um, you know, because rock was really changing the rock that uh, had made the first iteration of heart, you know, what it was, uh, was no longer really, the uh, sound was not really selling. Yeah. So that's, yeah. So well, that's, it did get, I mean, that's just a, a fact of the eighties is that it, it changed dramatically from rock to more synthy sound. Yeah. Right. And it, it, it did. Yeah. I mean, it, I think it had to do with, with you know, it, it, many, many changes in the industry have to do with tech developments, right. And new right. things. And yeah. Yeah. And they rolled with it and, and did okay. Um, I, I really, I, I, I'm so pleased that these dreams was a number one hit and the lyrics were written by Bernie Toppin. Uh, what a, what a cool collaboration to be able to work with Bernie, who was, uh, isn't he Elton John's lyricist? Or yes, indeed, and yeah. you know, such a uh, such a hero for us. Um, we were massive Elton John fans and knew those records intimately, every syllable. And so, um, that song actually uh, was written, sort of existed, and was out there in the "This Is Available" universe. It wasn't written. We didn't work. You know, they didn't work directly with Bernie. I think he had pitched it to. Uh, I think. Um, he wrote it with a wonderful uh, writer named Martin Page, and I think they had pitched it to the uh, Starship at that time. Oh, okay. But they, and, and they actually they wrote "We Built This City," the, the, um, Bernie and Martin Page. Okay. Uh, so that was around the same time, yeah. you know. Um, and so I think that uh, that Nevison brought that song, um, uh, and uh, I, I actually was there the night that they were uh, going through songs, and. Um, and he played that one, and uh, Anne was not that interested. It, it was very synthy, uh, the demo, and she just was not vibing with it at all. Um, I, I, that's an overstatement. She just she just couldn't find her place in it. It was there were just there was not rock and didn't have guitars. And, but Nance heard something in it, and she I remember she went up to the speaker and put her arms around it, uh, this and just said that's mine and mm. the. Physically took possession of that. <laughs> she physically took it. <laughs> That's great. What a great story. As you may have noticed, there are great resources and advice mentioned in all our episodes. And for many of them, we actually collect all of these resources for you in one easy place. Our newsletter. You can go to dreampathpod.com slash newsletter to join. It's not fancy. Just an email about each week's episode featured artists, and resources to help you on your journey. Thanks. And now back to the interview. So at this time in the 80s, uh, at the same time in the Pacific Northwest, there was this grunge scene that was developing and morphing into something that really became uh, sort of a signature sound in the early 90s that mm -hmm. you know, resulted in, uh, you know, Mother Love Bone and um you know nirvana and mud honey and all of these were, were you tuned in to what was happening in the seattle area at that time not only was i not tuned in but i remember uh that uh i think nance mentioned her dear friend kelly curtis uh who was her, her you know i think he was 10 when they met a uh, lifelong friend and of course i i knew i knew kelly very well too uh but i remember i got a call from kelly who at that time uh was sort of was still trying to find his way in music he knew he wanted to be in music he had been the publicist for heart he traveled a lot and then he was back in seattle feeling his way and 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 i remember he called me 
uh, one night and said, you have to come down to, uh, oh, what was the name of that? What's uh, the central, uh, the central in Pioneer Square. You mean tavern? still there? Central Tavern. Yeah. And, uh, and I, and I knew that it was sort of a grungy, uh, to use that word, you know, place that I, no, I don't think so. And he said, you, I'm going to send a taxi for you. I mean, he was so, he was so adamant that I come and you've got to see this band. Uh, Mother, Lo- no, I think they were called Mookie Blaylock at the time. No, they were, they were Mother Love Bone. I'm sorry. Mother Love Bone. And, so I, you know, I really, okay, okay. I mean, he just kept after me, and to his credit, I mean, that's what you do. And so I went down there, and lo and behold, there were a bunch of my friends around. And so clearly, uh, Kelly had called everybody and done the same sales job on them. I will send a taxi to bring you down here. So here's all these people, and here comes Mother Love Bone, and uh, and so there's there, you know, okay, they're they're kind of loud, um, and I. I just thought, okay, well, they're they're not they're not bad. But then the lead singer um, Andrew was uh, Andrew I thought, Wood, right? Andrew Wood. Yeah. I just was sitting, you know, sort of in the back, just taking him in, going, "I'm not. Sh- what is this? You know, what? Okay, what is this?" I and and he started to swing the microphone out over the crowd you know almost in like a roger daltrey move daltrey Mm -hmm. used to uh swing the mic and um and and i thought oh no this is like a guy in his bedroom pretending to be roger that was my association (laughs) but it did be (laughs) roger daltrey Yeah. yeah derivative like oh and then you have to swing the mic and so uh so he's swinging it and it started to come way low you know to like it it became dangerous Mm -hmm. and i thought this guy what is what is this about? And He's so I, I I thought he was a jackass. <laughs> and then he took a full pitcher of beer and just threw it over the crowd. Oh my god. And I goodness. went, you know, I I'm out of the I'm out. I'm I, I'm too old to appreciate what this is saying. I mean, mm-hmm. I I don't know what it's not for me. And uh and I remember uh leaving not in a huff or anything, but just like I, I don't get it. And um and so and uh, Kelly's like, isn't this great? <laughs> he, <laughs> he did come up. What do you think? And, you know, I, I was going, God, he just about hurt people with the mic. And he goes, oh, you know, he's just trying to find him. He's trying to find his persona. But the main thing is the music. Right. And, you know, I could I could sort of see it. But I never I mean, your question was, you know, did did I see it? Did I know about it? What did I think? Right. I did not. I could not get it. Yeah. And uh, this was and, and I do think uh that he was experimenting that Andrew did finally find a really cool stage persona. You know, it was early days and yeah. he was trying to, trying to, but, um, but yeah. Then, and then um, that morphed into Pearl Jam, right? Yes, it did. Yes, After it Andrew did. died. Andrew died. Yes. And that was really interesting. I guess the one thing that I could tell you about my observations, I was really on the periphery of this, not so much, you know, center uh but certainly Ann and nance were invited into the fold uh a little bit because of kelly and um and i remember that when andrew od'd he you know the the it was a, it was devastating at naturally to his band and to kelly who had started to um to manage them and uh they all got together for this i think nance mentioned this you know kind of a uh you know to be together as a family would in in their grief and um and and Nance I think went to that uh you know and not that she was in the in any case she she and she told me something that I I, I never forgot she said this 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 is something special in this band um it's more than professional these this these guys are family and and they are completely loyal and bonded to each other. They've been through this really heavy thing. And um, and Kelly is a part of it. And Kelly is leading them almost like a, you know, he, he was in the youth group, almost like one of their youth group leaders from the church way back when, uh, you know, opening his house up. And I, and I was really touched by that. And then when I learned that uh, Kelly never had a, uh, a written contract with them, that he was that they worked on a handshake, you know, their whole career with him. Uh, I thought that's that that's where it started, you know. That speaks volumes about Kelly and also those band members, doesn't it? Yeah, they're they're really ex- 
excellent people, you know. Shep Gordon is the same way. I don't know if you've ever met Shep before, but I've heard so many great interviews with him. I and and seen uh um you know Mike Myers uh uh documentary. Oh, Supermensch. Yeah, have you seen that? I did. Yeah. Isn't that something? I, something. I was so impressed with that documentary and with Shep. And I, I reached out to Shep because um it was it was a stupid thing. He in the documentary, he talked about this flight that he had with Alice Cooper, Shep did, mm-hmm. where he he said there was a an emergency landing or they thought they were gonna crash, and that was the real life incident that inspired Cameron Crowe to write the scene in Almost Famous um, about, uh, you know, which, which made it into the film where they almost crashed and, you know, it was, it was a comical scene. But the reason I reached out to him, and this is so dumb, I don't know why I even cared, but um, after my dad died in 2003, Ann and Nancy, through Carol Peters, their manager at the time, emailed my sister and I expressing their condolences and telling stories about my dad. And one of those stories was on a flight. um, There was a near crash landing where they had to land in a field somewhere. And Cameron used that as inspiration for almost famous. And, and I watched, I went and watched the movie and, you know, sure enough, the, the pilot's name was Craig, not Greg. And, it all made sense, and then I conf- I confirmed that recently with uh, Greg Mariotti, who is um, Cameron's partner in Vinyl Films. And, oh, right. Uh, yeah, and he told me he's like, "Oh, yeah, that was based upon you know the flight with your dad, not Shep." And so, anyway, I, that's how petty I am. I was like, I, I emailed um, Shep or I messaged him on Facebook, and and I asked him about that. He's like, "No, no, no, that was really the flight I had with Alice Cooper." You know, and I was like, okay, well, but anyway. <laughs> well, I had always heard, uh, you know, I'd been on some, some of those flights on those on that small plane uh, with your dad at the helm. And um, and and some of those those flights were really bumpy and really scary. Yeah. You know, in that little plane, you, you feel yeah, everything. Yeah, the little King Air, and I think it was. King yeah. Air, it sure was. And, yeah. um, and I remember, uh, you know, Howard Lease was the least – uh, comfortable <laughs> flyer <laughs> and nothing against how he, you know, he's the most brilliant guitar player. And, you know, none of us was really, but Howard really didn't like it. And, and I remember one time, uh, Cameron being on there and he looked pretty white too, because we were just, we were going every which way, uh, in the South, I think through a, um, tornado. And, and that's when I thought, oh, that's, that's when he, that's where he got the idea. <laughs> Cause he had actually been there with looking at Howard's face, just, no. Right. <laughs> it was amazing. It was very scary. And uh I so I would I will uh, vote for vote for the Hart story for sure on that yeah. one. Yeah. So how how much did you travel with Hart on tour and how much did you see my dad? You know, um not that not that often. I I did I I do have a da- I do have a, a a Greg Smith story. Uh, so I would say um, you know when I wasn't in school I would go out uh, on tour with them, and then wh- I got really tired you know uh, on the road. I mean I just was not made for that kind of pace, and so I I started to just be one of those people because I was not in the band, who would sort of sit back and say, <clears throat> oh, you're playing L.A.? I guess I'll come to that. Or mm-hmm. you're playing Chicago? So I, I would choose those dates and uh, come and, and see them. So I, I did I did see many, many shows, but I did not do the sort of grind. I did a couple of the grind day in, day out, you know, two-week kind of things. But um, but uh, I remember that uh, we were uh, they were going to play in... in um, outside of Frankfurt, Germany. And uh, so they put together a, a, a small tour that had a number of dates in the UK. I remember they played um, in Leeds. And I'm just remembering this uh, with The Who. Oh, and wow. that was fun. That was fun to see The Who up close, you know, oh, backstage. Amazing. And that yeah. was really a thrill. And, um, but, uh, but so, and so, yeah, Greg was, um, was the pilot for that tour. And, um, and I remember also just a, a little uh, also preface was that Anna Nance and I went over early before the band came over and uh, and took a little Beatle tour. And so, um, you know, they 
they rented a, a nice car in London and we drove up to Liverpool, uh, you know, on the left side of the road. And it was all just, you know, but it was they, it was great because it was just the three of us. We had an amazing time. <clears throat> uh, we finally met up with the band, I think, in Edinburgh. It was it was just a great, great time. And then we um, I think we actually flew from Edinburgh to to Frankfurt. And came in at around 1130 at night. Well, the airport was closed. And so uh, Greg said, the airport's closed. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we're driving, drive, we're flying around and everybody's like, what are we going to do? And uh, and he goes, well, you know, there's a number of things we could fly to, Ham you know, we'd fly to Hamburg, we could fly here, fly here. And then. Uh, the the manager was real, you know. Ken Kinnear was nervous, and you know, okay, we've got to go to the next spot. And Greg said, "I'll just land it here." <laughs> and so uh, every and they were going, yeah, but there's no runway lights. And he goes, "I mean, because he'd had so much experience, right? Wasn't didn't he fly in Vietnam?" Oh yeah, 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 yeah. He and was... he was so confident. And he said, "I'll just I'll just put it down. And <laughs> no one has to know." So everyone went really and and the, of course the management was happy about it because of the next day we you know we had to be at certain places so it was important to get so so we land on a dark runway <laughs> and just fine and we are way the hell out at the end of a dark runway uh not there's nothing and um so what are we going to do um well so everybody said and so greg goes well I'll, let's just start I'll, I'll just start walking toward the terminal we'll see if we meet somebody and we'll tell them to come out and get the get the bags and um and so um so anna ned said well take sue she speaks german <laughs> and so uh so he said, okay, come on. So here's Greg and I walking across this, you know, the tarmac in the dark. Um, and kind of, and he was kind of jogging. And I think he was, you know, pumped up or he was like, they've got to get something going here. You know, this is kind of a weird situation. Uh, and so I remember kind of running after him and, and, uh, and he's, and so he, uh, we, he said, oh, look, there's a, like a little, uh, almost like a little trailer with a light on, uh, you know, halfway to the, through the big, to the big um, uh, terminal up ahead. And so we, we went over there and, um, there was a guy in there snoozing. It was just like in a movie, <laughs> you know, sitting at his desk, you know. And uh, and so so we knock at the door. Greg Greg starts saying, hey, we've got, you know, uh, we've got a, a plane out here and we need to have, a, can you get some transportation? And the guy said, I spreche kein English. No, no English. And so, uh, so Greg goes, tell him. <laughs> Tell him that we have. <laughs> and so I, you know, so I did. I said, you know, in my best German, uh, which, you know, was okay, but not, but enough to be understood. Um, right. You know, it's a flug, flugzeug uh, is here. You know, and so, so he, uh, so, and, and sure enough, the guy understood and called. And pretty soon they had a couple of buses coming out to, uh, to pick us up with the luggage and they all dropped, they dropped us off in front of the, the, the building, everything closed, knock, knock, nothing there, all the, um, it's not, it's dark. And, mm -hmm. um, so now what do we do? We're illegally in a country. There's no, uh, passport control. <laughs> no customs. No. <laughs> There's no yeah. customs. And so, um, we were peeking into this huge, uh, huge room that I think was customs. Uh, clearly, that's where they dropped us off. And um, somebody opened a door in the far corner, and I screamed, uh, and I said, "Ya yeah, bitte hallo," you know. And she and and it was um, a cleaning woman, and uh, so she, I said, "Bitte come here, bitte come and see here," yeah, and and and. Everyone was going, say it louder. And so she started to come and she came up and, you know, I, I mean, I wish I had a huge, oh, great ending for this story, but she actually, you know, opened the door and said, was ist das? And she was Turkish. She didn't speak German too well. I didn't speak German too well, but I was, a, I was, I was able to, um, we opened the door and she goes, no, 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 it's, no, it's, no, it's good. And, and I said, no, 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 I said, all is good. And so I held it and, 
all the band members went under my arm with their bags and ducked in <laughs> to this place. And, uh, and I, as I talked to her and tried to keep her from uh, blowing the whistle, Calling and the police. Uh, we got, yeah, we got in and, you know, we just didn't, I don't know how we got out because we never had the, you didn't you have know, the stamp the going stamp. in. Yeah. Nope. So uh, we just went to our hotel and, Everyone went, it's a good thing you speak German. And, and uh, you know, it was great. It was actually a really, uh, you know, an unforgettable adventure. But um, but your dad was such a go-getter, so fearless. You know, yeah. I'll just, well, it was just great. That's awesome. That's a great story. Thanks for sharing that. I, so I don't have to. a lot of stories uh, of his adventures on the road, but the ones I do have are very much like that, where he he just kind of... Um, blazes his own path and and is totally. fearless. And that's fearless. actually, you know, closed airports are no, he was no stranger to closed airports because that's how he learned to fly when he was 16. He actually, oh, would, no kidding. he hopped the fence at airports and would steal planes and just take <gasps> Where off. Where was this? In um, Lake Tahoe, I believe. Okay. Wow. Yeah. And he would just take planes <laughs> wow. and he, he was self-taught. And then, of course, when he went to the military and, and officer candidate school, and that's when he got his official training to become a helicopter, um, assault helicopter pilot and wow. later um, learning wow. to fly uh, commercial aircraft and whatnot. But yeah, so thank you for that, Sue. That's great. Oh, my pleasure. I love that story. Uh, you know, because really without him, you know, I don't know. I mean, no other pilot would have done that. You know, it's like, we're not going <laughs> to, we're not landing on a black, uh, a black runway, but, uh, but, uh, he saved the day and everybody made it to the gig the next day. So That's that funny. was terrific. Yeah, it was fun. So let's, um, let's go back a little bit. Um, Love Mongers. Tell us about Love Mongers because that's a project that I think was a mid '90s, uh, maybe '97 or so, and that's where you were actually in the band with Ann and <laughs> Nancy, right. right? Yeah. Um, so that started uh, with uh, an offer uh, for a benefit uh, to Ann and Nance, um, and at that time uh, they had had um, the, the band was uh, off. It, it, there wasn't sort of a, a the band was not solid. Uh, they you know they had made a record and that didn't do that well. Um, people were doing other projects, and so um, and I think Anne and Nance were very tired, and so they were they were very much a duo at that time, trying to figure out what the next thing was. And they wanted to strip things down after the big production, the hair, the the MTV uh, uh, of it all. Uh, and that was sort of their mindset at that time that was underscored and really supported by what was happening uh, really in the, um, you know, the aesthetic of the scene in Seattle. You know, it was to be to do it yourself uh, and, uh, you know, none of the trappings of the big uh, spectacle uh, with with grunge. And um, and so that's kind of where where they were when this uh, benefit offer came in. Um, to play at the Paramount, just a couple of songs. And so I remember we were out at Nance's uh, farm in Woodenville just for fun with our friends, uh, Frank Cox and some others, a bunch of people uh, one night. And and it, as it got later, um, Anne said, you know, we should really try to figure out what we're going to do for the show, uh, what kind of songs. And so we started singing uh, some old old sort of folk tunes and, and a Peter Paul and Mary song. And, you know, it was all over the map and, and that's, and, uh, and, and Frank Cox, uh, our dear friend, uh, has this, you know, had this beautiful tenor and they, they, they were singing great, um, harmonies. And, and I think Anna Nance said, get, you should come on stage with us. You know, let's just, um, you know, you guys can back us up. They want Anna Nancy Wilson, but we can, we can deliver a kind of a beautiful, a uh, beautiful vocal thing with all mm -hmm. of us, and so let's let's do that. So that's really where it started. Just uh, you know, at the farmhouse uh, late one night, and uh, it, we all thought it was a one-off, um, and it certainly seemed to be that way. But then it was so much fun, and Anne, knowing Anne, any chance to get a group together and to sing, you know, so this is all of, all of a sudden we're, we're a group. And we were, I remember that night we were laughing and said, this is, a, this is almost like a little band. And we said, what do we call ourselves? And, uh, and uh, 
we were thinking uh, about different things. Someone said the hate mongers and someone, no, the love mongers. And we laughed with that. It's just really silly name, but fun. And uh, especially for the occasion. So that's where the name came from uh, as almost like a joke. And then it seemed pretty fun. And, um, and soon enough, uh, we had a couple of, uh, uh, of people come forward, a, a little uh, little label uh, through Fred Meyer of all places uh, that was starting up, and um, a huge heart fan, uh, Brant Berry, what a great guy, and he said, "I I want to make a, a Love Mongers record. I have a budget from my you know from the company, and so we uh, started writing songs and and I made a record uh, very uh, and released it on this little tiny indie label." And no one really thought that it was going to be become anything, and it, it you know it found its it found its fans. But um, mm -hmm. what what it really was was a wonderful. I see it as a um, as a great re you know reprieve for Anna Nance to get back to their roots in a sense, which were acoustic and yeah. were a uh, vocal you know harmony based, and uh, and I think they were really refreshed by all that, and we were sort of there to. Uh, Frank and I to support them and to lend our, you know, and, and we wrote, we actually wrote songs, all of us together. So that's, that's the story of the love mongers. We did a couple of little tours and played some, some uh, clubs up and down the West coast, just had a, a ball, you know, and I think it was, um, you know, friends on the road. Um, yeah. And, and it was just great. Lots of jokes came from that. The harmonies were great I, I just listened to miracle girl before the interview oh, and wow. that song sounds a lot like i mean it's so full and robust in terms of the layers and the harmonies it sounded like a broadway tune almost like i don't know if you've seen springtime is it spring awakening yeah i have it, it kind of reminded me of like a spring awakening really um sort of joyous uh har yeah. harmony driven song you know, I haven't heard that in so long, but I remember it being really musical uh, and melodic and, um, and yeah, and those harmonies. Yeah, that's, that's fun. That's right. So a um, couple more questions. I know we've been going over an hour sure. here and I appreciate okay. your time. No, that's fine. So I, I remember listening to another interview with you where you said that Baby Lestrange was the first album where you had publishing. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what that means. Can you tell us what publishing is and what it means to an artist? I can. You know, I just taught a class earlier today on publishing, so I think I can. I think I can uh, pull that out. Uh, I'll I'll put on my teacher hat here for just a minute, and okay. you know, ask people to bear with me. It's not. It's not very difficult, and it's not very long. So here's the here's the idea. Um, you've got a song. Uh, you've got the songwriter, and every song. Uh, has to have a publisher associated. So first thing to do is forget everything you know about the word publishing, like book publishing, newspaper publishing. This is something very different. Uh, the the term actually arose out of uh, you know going way way back to the 30s. Um, the idea of sheet music that was published, and that's how people you know got their music. So that's where the word publishing comes from. But music publishing now uh, really uh, just means. Um, uh, sort of overseeing this copyrighted song or a number of them, right? So, um, so, uh, so there's a there's a publisher associated with every song, and they kind of do the, the paperwork around that. So they issue licenses. If someone wants to cover your song, they'll write that license out. They'll get the they'll get the uh, the contract going, and someone will pay uh, the publisher. The publisher collects all of the money. Uh, that comes in if you get, let's say, a, a song placed in a movie. That fee will come to the publisher. Uh, all of the streaming fees, uh, all of that comes to the publisher, and the publisher splits it right down the middle. They take half, and they pay their songwriter half. Mm. Um, and if you've got a bunch of songwriters, you're going to be sharing what's called the writer's share, which is 50% of that total income. So the more writers you have, the less... <laughs> the less it, less good it is for your bank account. But uh, uh, I, I only laugh because I uh, I was at the Grammys once and they said, uh, they, they and there was a song up, um, for Song of the Year and it had 19 writers on it. Uh, oh and, I, and, you know, and I just thought, wow, what a different age, right? Mm -hmm. You know, because, um, 
And those 19 people are sharing 50% of something. So, <laughs> but anyway, um, so that's really what it is. So your publisher, if you, you know, if you have a, 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 a publisher, someone interested in representing your, your songs as a songwriter, um, they, uh, they take half your money, but they do a lot of things for you. Not only the, that, that paperwork I mentioned, uh, you know, they register your copyrights and so on, but also, um, they, uh, they, they, they push your, your songs for you into the hands of people who might want to cover your song and so, uh, or, or do something with it that generates money. And that might be something that you as a writer in Seattle can't really do. You don't have those contacts. So the publisher will put you in touch with, uh, you know, maybe co-writers. They will open avenues and doors for you that you wouldn't necessarily have. So it's great to have a publisher. Uh, in that way, if no publishing company is interested in you, very often the case, uh, for uh, then you are your own publisher. But every song has a publisher. Professor Ennis, thank you for that lesson. <laughs> That's why they pay me the big bucks. No, right. uh, no, I, you know, I, I love, I actually love talking about this stuff, and it's, it's a concept that very few people, you know, get. You gotta, gotta kind of learn it. So yeah, and I heard on the. Nancy Wilson interview with Mark Marin that, um, or was it, I think it, no, I think it was with, uh, it was another podcast interview she did called, um, record store day, I believe hmm. with Paul Myers. I'll have to send you the link, the link to that oh, cool. because he specifically asked about you and your relationship oh, really? with Nancy. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. He talks about <laughs> you and, uh, yeah, I'll send you the link to that, uh, today, but I think she said, Nancy said that she gave you one of her signature Martins, that you were the one of the, one of the folks this that she gave, true. gave that true. guitar to. So uh, where does that guitar sit and uh, do you play it? Very good. Yes, she did. I was lucky enough to, uh, you know, it was, and she didn't tell me. It was just one day the UPS guy or FedEx comes and there's this big heavy thing and I open it and it's like, she sent me a Martin, you know, and then it's this incredibly beautiful guitar, uh, as you can imagine, designed by her with all, all these personal touches, the beautiful wood she chose. I mean, it is, it is Nance's wish and creation. Mm -hmm. So, um, so I didn't, in, in any case, it is uh, it is in the next room. Um, I don't play it as much as I should because uh, I it, the uh, the action needs to be lowered a little bit. Mm -hmm. So when I play it, it's like oh, you know, in order to make a pure chord, it's like, so that I have to have just a little bit of tweaking done on it. But it is a beautiful thing, and I cherish it. You know, I just yeah. I'm 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 nervous to you know even almost play too it pretty to ways. play. <laughs> almost in some ways, yeah. 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 If you need a good, good, you probably already know about about Mike Lowell's guitar shop, Mike Past. Yes, um, I think last year, but um, his son is carrying on, and I oh, think, I didn't know that. I'm yeah, glad you mentioned it. That shop but... is still at it, and I've taken my guitars in since Mike Past, and they're doing a great job. That is great to know. I'm going to go there because I'd love to, you know, carry on the tradition. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's great to know. Thanks. I got Michael's yeah. name from Roger, actually, because I interviewed Roger. He was like one of the first guests on my podcast. Oh, wow. How long have you been going with this? A couple oh, of good. years. That's great. Yeah, I started in March of 2019, and I think uh, Mike Mike Fisher and Roger Fisher, I interviewed them at the same time. They were uh, interviews or episodes four and five i believe okay early um, on it was such a long interview i had to split it into two episodes so <laughs> <laughs> they had a lot to say they did yep yeah i hope and, they uh, i hope they said nice things about me no i'm kidding i'm sure were, i didn't even come up but yeah. uh yeah that's great good good that's good have you interviewed any of the other guys in heart no i reached out to howard and he wasn't interested at all in, uh, uh -huh. in, in okay you know it wasn't anything personal he just isn't no. into it's not his it's not his style yeah he's down yeah. in vegas i think doing uh you know doing yeah, his thing at those shows vault thing yeah yeah right. the vault mm -hmm. um and i haven't had a chance to talk to any of the other folks like derosier or um you know ken kinnear could can connect me i'm sure with um ken's still around by the way so oh good yeah uh, yeah good to know i haven't heard about him in years good but uh, I, I was, you know, I wanted to finish off with uh, a little discussion about your current um, profession. You are 
teaching at Shoreline Community College, right? That's right. And, and you have uh, sold out songwriting classes, and I'm fascinated <laughs> by the the concept of teaching someone how to write a song because mm. I um, I heard an interview with Chris Martin from Coldplay, and and I was I think it was during the Bee Gees uh, documentary. I don't know if you've seen the Bee Gees documentary. Oh yet. yes, I have. I just ate up every second of it. I mean, Wasn't I almost it wonderful. It was almost like a kid. I just couldn't get close enough to take in every, you know, <laughs> it was well, just fantastic. The way Chris Martin from Coldplay described songwriting on that documentary, he said something like songwriting is more like capturing energy that's out there. It's it's you aren't creating it, but mm. you are and I, I'm I'm probably butchering this, but you're channeling something mm -hmm. that's just out there and you have to be able to listen and understand what you're hearing so that you can properly uh, memorialize that energy into the song that you're writing. I thought I thought that was a beautiful way of describing it. Almost mm -hmm. like we're a vessel uh and you know, we have we don't have as much to do with creating a great song as we think we may do. Yes. Um, so when you are teaching songwriting, how do you approach it me you know, mechanically and also the more um, spiritual part that Chris Martin's talking about in terms yeah. of like that energy? Well, um, I think that there are plenty of songwriters who don't necessarily uh, have that channeling, um, but there is a craft to writing, right? right? And there are things you can teach. Uh, you can teach uh, how to how, song structure, you know, the architecture of putting a, a song together that'll keep your your, your listener engaged. Uh, and, uh, and and lyric writing, you know, the, the, the idea of capturing something in a way where it hasn't been said before, uh, you know, th things like that. We talk about, uh, you know, having a song that has a North Star to it, a, a central concept concept that sometimes is encapsulated in a title. I mean, some people write songs just by collecting titles, you know, and, uh, and, and we'll be jamming out something some night and go, what should I call this? Go look at your title list and go, oh, that's exactly what this one is called. And so, you know, there are different ways to get something going. Um, but I know what, I, I think when you do have that moment, when you're so, uh, you know, lost in, or maybe not maybe th found in uh in your uh in the moment of you know creating something you're letting uh, these these the stuff is going through your head and then something lands you maybe you sing a melody and you think where did that come from uh, that's you know that's the magic isn't it that's mm. probably what he's talking about yeah and you're really grateful for that and that's the thing that keeps you coming back more than anything else it's like will i will i be able to not it's not something that you set out to do it's something you make yourself available uh, for if it happens and right. uh and and it doesn't Ha it, it, you know, it doesn't necessarily happen with everyone, but I'd say the more the songs, more songs you write, the better your chances. You know, yeah, so right, yeah, you I, can practice. I can see that. I mean, the craft, just like with acting, there's a craft of acting, and then there's the art or the the thing about acting that you know Robert De Niro can't teach yeah. someone else how to be Robert De Niro. I mean, there's yeah. there's some magic there to to what he does. And uh, I would imagine in songwriting, there's there's the something the equivalent to grammar. I mean, you just yeah. there are do's and don'ts mm -hmm. about the craft of songwriting, especially if you're cranking out like Willie Nelson, ten thousand songs. <laughs> I know, yeah. And not all of those are coming from a magical place. <laughs> Maybe no, they're not. You know? No, they're not. And um, you know, there are some uh, people I've met uh, along the way. Uh, who are successful writers? Uh, uh, one guy, this great guy, Daryl Brown, who's had a ton of success in the, in the country world, especially with Leanne Rhymes, 
he's just a great guy. And uh, I met him through the Grammys at, uh, organization. And uh, and he told me once that he had to write 120 songs before he wrote a good one. And, mm. you know, and that's that's the part that is uh, it, it can be fun, but it's it's almost, you know, it's it's like any other skill you get. The more you practice, the next time you write a song, you, you, you're just a little bit better. I think it really is like that unless you're a protege and then, you know, then. Yeah. Good for you. Right. <laughs> but, you know, th then you're Paul McCartney, um, you know, where yesterday just appeared to him. Uh, yeah. So if if I were to hire you uh, to give me private songwriting lessons, and um, how would that lesson start? So let's say I, I hire you for this lesson and I, I have like a chord progression. And, um, you know, it's like a, a D, C... G chord progression. And then um, I maybe have some lyrics like, I wrote some lyrics in high school a long, long time ago. Um, I believe that people change for the better. Yeah. When it went our separate ways, I hoped it wasn't forever. No, it's not the end of the world. Life goes on. Life goes on. Okay, so that's a high school little ditty that I wrote. It sounds like a high nice. school ditty, right? Mm -hmm. um, but it's okay. It's there's good. no, there's no bridge. Mm -hmm. There's I have another um, set of lyrics that, that are that are kind of cheesy, but where would you take me from there? Like, w what would the process look like in a, in an hour long lesson to try to flush out where to go and how to refine whatever was created there? Mm -hmm. So what I would do is, and I'll commend you on the fact that you knew there there needed to be a change in the melody after the first two lines, right? Mm -hmm. Like you, you sang them the same, the, and you know, it was like an A, A section and you, yeah. you, your first thought line, and then your second one is the same. And the third one, you gave us a little change up, which was great. And then the fourth one was, a, was a different one. Uh, all oh, life goes on. Um, so that's great. You have an instinct there for when the changes should come. Um, and so, and then I would think the song is called life goes on because you said it three times or four yeah. times, three, mm -hmm. two, three. Uh, and that's almost like, um, and I start to get an, uh, a, a sense of structure. I guess that's how I would first approach it. And I'd say, is this a verse? In a way, it's storytelling. Is it a chorus? Not really. It's 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 a storytelling song. It's a singer-songwriter song. Not that it has to fit into a category, but I'm trying to figure out where do we go from here. And uh, so, and if it's um, not, if it doesn't have a chorus, does that mean that it's a ballad? Mm -hmm. it, okay. Yeah, it's storytelling. That's right. right. Yeah, and so I mean, your hook, your is is your tag is life goes on, and that's. And so that is that puts us into like a folk ballad style. Um, and so I would then uh, do the same thing again, times two. Uh, this would be like an A section of four lines and then a B and then an A, another one, A section of four lines. So the next part, you have to you have to further your story and you have now bumped up against the second verse curse, uh, which is uh, a joking way that uh, songwriters talk about. And now what do I do? OK, I've got the, I've got the <laughs> right. I've got, right. So I got this far and I've got a little idea going. Uh, so the second part. The second verse, the second stanza, uh, uh, you know, needs to advance the story in some way. You need to, what else about this? Right. So uh, a good way, a good approach there is then what happens, you ask yourself. Okay. okay? Right. Yeah. So you're going to write one more of those, same formula, same format, okay. same stanza, da, da, same melody, um, and uh, hopefully, you know, get a little bit further with your story. I'd probably go into something more personal instead of um, general observations about life. Okay. I would start to go 
personal and say the first time I met you, I don't know what it is, but you know, uh, you know, I, I, I took a walk out this morning and saw this. It start so I, I'd go to that would be a contrast right. that you're looking for. Yeah. Um, and th- those contrasts are are important because again, your job as a good writer is to keep the listener engaged. Mm. So after two of those, let's call them A sections, they're identical, A, A. Now we need a B. We need to contrast. We can got to go somewhere else. And so what I what I would have you do or suggest that you follow is um how can we how can we do something that contrasts with what we have in in a big way. So maybe it's um you know how okay contrast with uh the, almost like it's almost becomes a bridge in a sense. Okay. Some people might call it that, a B section, a a a departure. Uh and so it should it should contrast in every possible way and still belong to the song. So, uh, you know, it, lyrically, maybe you sh- shift perspective there. Uh, and, you know, the I song becomes a, a little bit of a different, you know, a, a, a memory. For example, you can go back in time. You can get introspective in in that uh, in that section a little bit more than you have been. Anything lyrically that that contrasts with where you've been, and then also musically. So. Um, you know, you've got those rhythms going in your uh, A sections. I would, I would probably lengthen the lines to contrast. Uh-huh. So make, you know, uh, and I want to da 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 da. I'm just making that up, but you see yeah. what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. That contrast, and then go back to that A section, and it feels really good after that departure into the B. It's like it a just, callback in a way. It's like it's a callback. It's yeah. a return home. Something that you've set up, oh, and wow. uh, and you know, and, and maybe you want to elaborate. You know, elaborate on life goes on in your B section. You mm-hmm. know, talk about that because that's what the song's about. So, yeah. what can you say about that? Yeah, um, that's a know? good question. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> well, I love I love how just instantly the wheels started turning when I. I mean, I didn't tell you that I was going to do this and you immediately just saw and heard what needed to be explored. And uh, after just a few seconds of hearing, you know, lyrics and a couple of chords, that's fantastic. Oh, you know, it's so fun to do. And who knows if that would work for you. But I, 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 I'm at a place, you know, and having done it enough where I, I certainly can throw ideas at a, at a collaborator and say, maybe this, maybe this, maybe this, maybe this. And Mm -hmm. then, uh, and then you can run with it. Yeah. Well, Sue, it's been a huge pleasure to talk to you and thanks for sharing your story with us. I'm so glad we finally got to, uh, got to meet. It's, it's really great, uh, to meet you. And, um, and, you know, I love telling these stories. They're fun and it's fun to reminisce and think about how lucky I've been, you know, be reminded of that. Uh, so thank you for inviting me. Absolutely. And I, I will be heavily promoting this Nancy Wilson solo album, which features you, you on the You and Me track. And, yes, I've um, got two other songs on there, oh, okay. uh, which is uh, one's called I'll Find You and the other one is called Walk Away, which has got some strings on it. And boy, it got it got much bigger than we imagined in the production. Very happy with how it came out. So. I can't wait to hear those songs. I can't wait for you to hear them. I'm going to buy a physical copy of this album. Because, Are you really? Yeah. That's I, so cool. Well, it, it's just, it's very nostalgic for me. Anything heart related, uh-huh. anything oh, NFC yeah related, I, I'm going to pick up. So um, thanks again for talking to me. I will uh, let you know when the uh, episode launches so you can share I'll it with your folks. I'll promote it for you, yeah. definitely. Okay. And for listeners who want to connect with Sue on social media, it looks like you have a Twitter account at Sue Ennis, right? I do. Come and, say hello. And also a website, sueennis.com, S-U-E-E-N-N-I-S.com. And if you want to connect with her to request lessons, songwriting lessons, or just to ask questions. I'm sure she'd be happy to reach out and uh, and chat with you. I am available. Thank you so much, Brian, for promoting my... I, I don't say too much on Twitter, but when I do, it's about Nancy. No, yeah. <laughs> it is right I noticed now. that. I noticed that. <laughs> You're a good friend. Uh, yeah, she's a good... She's my, she's my girl. 
we we were so lucky to have to have each other. So again, thanks so much. Uh, really fun talking to you. And, really fun uh, talking to you, Sue. You take good. care. Good. I wish you the best. Hey, thank you for listening, and I hope you enjoyed today's episode. If so, I have a favor to ask. Can you go to wherever you listen to podcasts and leave me a review? Your feedback is what keeps this podcast going. You can also check us out on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook with the handle at DreamPathPod. And as always, go find your dream path.